Uh, I'm sure that all of you, I think, know at least one citation from Shakespeare. The one I came to think about right now is this one. What's in a name? That which we call a rose by any other name would smell as sweet. I'm not sure if that citation is the most appropriate one uh, when talking about MECFS, but anyway, it's kind of a, an introduction for the next speaker. Uh, so, we're very glad to have uh, the next speaker with us, Dr. Leonard Jason, Professor of Psychology and Director of the Center for Community Research at DePaul University, Chicago in the US. Uh, and as you already know, perhaps, uh, Dr. Uh, Jason will talk about MECFS case definitions and the importance of a name. Please, Dr. Leonard. Dr. Jason, sorry. Okay. Thank you for this invitation to your conference. My talk is on finding essential features of myalgic encephalomyelitis and chronic fatigue syndrome. Next. The next slide says stigma, and certainly there is a tremendous amount of stigma that occurs for people who are dealing with this illness. 95% of individuals seeking medical treatment for ME and CFS report feelings of estrangement. I'm sure that's probably something many of you know. This is some data from the US. 85% of clinicians view ME and CFS as wholly or partially psychiatric disorders as this slide indicates. In the United States and possibly in your country and other countries, hundreds of thousands of patients cannot find a single knowledgeable and sympathetic physician to take care of them. Next. Okay. The next slide should be stigma due to following issues. There is the term chronic fatigue syndrome, which is stigmatizing. Um, and in this title of stigma due to following issues, I will be talking about the case definition, which has reliability problems. And that is the focus of this talk. I will also talk about the severely ill patients with this illness. Next. Case definitions, which is the top of the slide, are really the foundations for studying illnesses. Case definitions are a set of rules that allow investigators and clinicians to determine who has and who does not have an illness. Case definitions are really like a stack of cards. At the bottom, you have to have a firm foundation. That's where the case definition is. If that case definition is not sturdy, then everything that's built on top of it becomes shaky, potentially problematic for the science. If a case, this is the next slide that says problems of unreliability. This slide came after the one that had the sack of cards. Problems of unreliability are due to difficulties with case definition. So the goal with the case definition is to select those with the illness and not select those without the illness. Subject, occasion, and information variance accounts for only a small portion of diagnostic reliability. Criterion variance accounts for the largest source of diagnostic unreliability. These are the differences in the formal inclusion and exclusion criteria to classify patients' data into diagnostic categories. Criterion variance occurs when operationally explicit criteria do not exist for diagnostic categories. Next slide. And I just want to check, everybody, you're still with me? Everything's good? Okay. I just want to make sure we're all together. Okay. Um, good. So, problems, the next slide says, if problems occur with case definitions, if there's ambiguities, investigators might select samples of patients who are different on fundamental aspects of this illness. This becomes an impediment to replicating findings across different laboratories. And it becomes exceedingly difficult 
to estimate the prevalence of the illness, to consistently identify biomarkers, and to determine which treatments help patients. At the present time, next slide, we have what's called a non-empirical case definition. So the original CFS consensus case definition was arrived at by a group of people at the Centers of Disease Control. Of course, other people participated as well. Um, and this became what's called the international case definition. This was called the FACUDA. Next case, next slide. The case definition is an international working group that in 1994 published the criteria and other criteria. Now, I'm sure that many in the audience are familiar with this criteria, so I won't spend much time on it. But basically, patients to meet these criteria are required to experience chronic fatigue and the concurrent occurrence of at least four out of eight other symptoms. Now, I've listed those symptoms here for those of you who just want to see what I think the ba basic problem with the Bakuda criteria are. The symptoms in white at the top are things that, again, are very common symptoms within the general population. Sore throat, tender cervical, axillary lymph nodes, muscle pain, muscle multiple joint pain without joint swelling or redness, headaches of new type, pattern, or severity. But the three symptoms at the bottom are the fundamental core aspects of this illness. And they include unrefreshing sleep, post-exertional malaise lasting more than 24 hours, and persistent or recurring impairment in short-term memory or concentration. The problem, as I think is evident, is if you only need four of these symptoms, it's possible not to have the three cardinal symptoms, classic symptoms at the bottom, and still be brought into the case definition. That's a major problem. Now, in Chicago, we did a population-based study using the Fukuda criteria. And we found that about 4% of the population experiences, yeah, this is the next slide, sorry. The population-based study in Chicago had about 4% of the population. So the slide at the top sh should say population-based study in Chicago. About 4% of the population experienced six or more months of fatigue. So something like about one out of 20 people, that's a very common symptom. Um, but about half those people have a real classic medical or psychiatric explanation. They might have melancholic depression. They might have something like cancer. They might have a very clear explanation for that fatigue. That's about half or 54% of that 4%. And about 27% of our group, um, about a quarter, meet these Fukuda criteria. And another 19% um, so 27% did not meet the Fukuda criteria, I'm sorry. That means that individuals did not have enough symptoms of those four out of eight. And 19% did meet these criteria. So in a sense, about 20% of individuals, 20% of individuals of those who have chronic fatigue um, meet the criteria for chronic fatigue syndrome. This suggests, translates with a somewhat complicated algorithm, that about 0.42% of the population in the United States and possibly in Sweden have this illness. What that means is that of every 200 people, you might have one person with the illness. So one out of 200 is about the prevalence rates. But here's the problem, as I said, with this criteria. In the research we did in the 1990s, we found that people who had major depressive disorders, if you weren't being careful, could be diagnosed with ME and, or CFS. For example, I think we all know that depression often involves chronic fatigue and four minor symptoms. Some of those symptoms include unrefreshing sleep, joint pain, muscle pain, and impairment in concentration. So what I'm suggesting is that basically some conditions like major depressive disorder, which are highly prevalent, about 2.3% of the population has a major depressive disorder at any one time in the United States. Um, the next slide that says possible misdiagnosis, yes, sorry. So basically what that says is that a person with major depressive disorder could be diagnosed with ME and CFS. And as you can see, these are the types of symptoms. Depression often has 50 and 
minor symptoms, some refreshing sleep, joint pain, muscle pain, impairment, and concentration. So that's the problem, that it's possible that people who have some psychiatric illnesses, like a major depressive disorder, which affects about 2.3% of the population, could be inappropriately classified as chronic fatigue syndrome. Next slide. So the cardinal criti criticisms of Fakuda is that they do not require cardinal symptoms, such as post-exertional malaise and memory and concentration problems. Those things should be required of all patients. Now, in part to deal with this, we have what's called the Canadian criteria. This was developed by Crothers and others in 2003. Um, and it does require specific symptoms to occur. Now, they call this case definition MECFS, and they do require post-exertional malaise. Now, that particular Canadian criteria over the last 10 or 12 years has been more frequently used, as probably many of you recognize. And they do require seven symptoms. Next slide. So just to go over those symptoms, of the 2003 Canadian, and they call it MECFS criteria, you have to have post-exertional malaise, unrefreshing sleep, pain, two or more neurocognitive manifestations, and at least one symptom from two of the following categories. Autonomic manifestations, like lightheadedness, neuroendocrine manifestations, like recurrent fe feelings of feverishness, and immune manifestations, like recurrent sore throats. So I guess what I'm suggesting is that these criteria were a benefit, and more and more investigators began using these criteria. But remember, these were a clinical set of criteria, not a research set of criteria, although they have now begun to be used for research purposes. A number of years later, next slide, we see the international consensus criteria for ME. And this is, again, a group of people, a larger group of people put this together. Um, and this particular case definition was really, rather than ME-CFS, was for ME. Um, ME-ICC, they call it. And symptom severity impact must result in a 50% or greater reduction in a patient's premorbid activity. But for a diagnosis, one now needs eight symptoms. So remember, we've gone from four symptoms of Fukuda to seven symptoms for the Canadian criteria to the MEICC new criteria of 2011, eight. And those symptoms are divided within these four areas, post-exertional neuroimmune exhaustion, neurological impairment, you need to have three symptoms there, immune gastrointestinal genital urinary impairments, three symptoms there, energy production transportation impairments. I might add that our work with factor analysis with very large samples have not come up with these four areas. Um, the other potential problem with having more symptoms is that you, mo you might have more possibilities of getting people with different types of more psychosomatic issues. The more somatic symptoms you require in a case definition, the more likely you are to get individuals with psychiatric comorbidity. That's the potential problem. Now, in 2015, we have the Institute of Medicine coming up with a name change recommendation. This is the next slide. So the Institute of Medicine recommended the name Systemic Exercise Intolerance Disease, SEID, and they said that should replace chronic fatigue syndrome and, and any other name that existed. Now, this has been a very widely distributed set of recommendations that has gone to the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee, and there's still work being done on it, but it's being written about widely. So because of that, I think it's important for us to recognize the name, SCID, and the clinical criteria. Now remember, this is not a research criteria, it's a clinical criteria. Next slide. Now, in the spring of this year, Lisa Petrosen did a patient survey of over a thousand patients, um, and they sent this survey to the Chronic Fatigue Syndrome Advisory Committee in the United States. And what Lisa Petrosen found in her survey was that the majority of respondents expressed negative opinions about the name SCID, about the naming 
how they came up with it, um, and about the idea of the government using the proposed name. So this particular patient survey has actually had quite a lot of an effect, I think, on making people think twice about um, adopting this new name. This is Lisa Patron's pa Lisa Petrison's patient survey at the top of this particular slide. Um, the next slide is um, dealing with the new clinical case criteria. Now, it's interesting that um, they do not call it a case definition, um, and I must admit, I can't understand the difference between an algorithm that says a case criteria versus a case definition, um, but they do call it a case criteria. Um, but if you basically specify a group of people who have an illness and a group of people who don't have an illness, I think that's what usually a case definition is considered. But for the purposes of the IOM, we'll call it a case criteria. One of the interesting issues about this new case criteria is that exclusionary illnesses are treated differently from the MEICC, from the Canadian criteria, from the FACUTA criteria, and even back um, to other criteria that have been used. And as you probably know, there's probably about 20 different case definitions that are out there. Um, so the SCID or the IOM tends to prefer saying illnesses are comorbid rather than exclusionary. So the FACUTA, the Canadian, and the MEICC really said that if you had a clear explanation of an illness, we were going to make those exclusionary. Um, I think the people who have put together the Institute of Medicine are thinking about a, a wider category. And let's think about what some of the implications of this wider category are for us. Next slide. So if we use the word SCID, systemic exertion intolerance disease, the Institute of Medicine recommends that there needs to be four symptoms. Um, now, basically, these four symptoms, for the most part, are things that um, a number of factor analytic studies, but done by a number of different research groups, including ours in the U.S., um, have tended to find that you do find um, a substantial reduction or impairment in ability to engage in pre-illness levels of occupational, educational, social, or personal activities. You do find post-exertional malaise. You do find unrefreshing sleep. Um, and they say at least one of the two following symptoms, cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. Um, we do find cognitive impairment in patients. Um, the orthostatic intolerance tends to occur less frequently. We tend to think of it as um, not as core a symptom as cognitive impairment. Um, among kids, I certainly think orthostatic intolerance has more prominence. But in any event, the Institute of Medicine has said you need to have these four domains. And if you have these four domains, you have the clinical criteria met. So now let's look at the implications. The reason this is important is that in the Institute of Medicine, which not only goes out to the U.S., but is influential around the world, including in Sweden, they said that in the next couple of years, they want to sort of reevaluate what they think of these clinical criteria. So if we're going to be reevaluating these criteria, one needs to develop databases to actually examine what are the implications of using these IOM criteria. Because if we don't do research and don't evaluate these particular criteria, then how are we going to make changes in the future? And the IOM certainly suggested they need to be revisited once we have more data. So here we have an opportunity. Next slide. We have published two articles in the last six months where we have compared the IOM, SCID, clinical criteria to other case definitions, including the Canadian criteria, the FACUTA criteria, the MEICC criteria, and we even have something called the London Ramsey criteria, which I haven't talked much about, um, but that's another one. And we looked at the implications we took four data sets, um, and what is the implications of taking off some of these exclusionary illnesses on the IOM? So the, the, the slide above should say analyze new case criteria. Um, is that one in front of you now? 
Okay, we'll go to the next one now. Study one. A study one involved 796 patients from the U.S., Great Britain, Norway. They completed our questionnaire, the DePaul Symptom Questionnaire. Findings indicated that the criteria of IOM, or SCID, identified 88% of participants in the samples. And if you used FACUTA criteria, it would have represented 92%. So we found basically with people who referred as having the illness to these different catchment areas, it really seemed to get comparable groups of people. Next slide. The recently developed SEID criteria appears to identify a group comparable in size if you have clinically based individuals. In other words, if they come from clinically based samples. But a larger group of patients than the Canadian MECFS and the MEICC criteria. So basically, if you use the Canadian or the MEICC criteria, you get fewer people identified than the SCID. IOM criteria, if that makes sense. Next slide. In study two, which we published, we looked at what happens with the issue of exclusionary illnesses. And we looked at four different data sets. And we basically took a look at individuals who weren't necessarily brought in with a referral of having severe fatigue. We looked at, for example, at a community-based epidemiology study where we'd have all types of people coming in and evaluated. And in that study, because it wasn't self-selected individuals, we found the IOM, SCID prevalence rate, would be increased 2.8 times. For example, 47% of those with melancholic depression, which was exclusionary when you had the FACUTA criteria, now meet SCID IOM criteria. In addition, we have a group of people with medical reasons for their fatigue. 48% met the SCID IOM criteria. So what the conclusion is, is that these IOM SCID criteria are going to bring in a larger group of people from the general population as meeting these criteria. And that slide should say study two exclusionary illnesses. Is that slide up there? Okay, we'll go to the next slide. So, the next slide says the SEAT criteria require a patient to have either cognitive impairment or orthostatic intolerance. Um, as I said, orthostatic intolerance does not evidence prevalence rates as high as other proposed core symptoms, whereas cognitive impairment does. Um, I don't think that's a, a significant problem because just about everybody who has cognitive impairment we find also has the orthostatic intolerance. So in a sense, it really does, just by having cognitive impairment, you get the same people. Next slide. So this is a summary, if I may, of what the epidemiology of this illness looks like. If you take the general population at any one time, this is the next slide, it says figure one, about 15, 15 to 25% of the population feels fatigue at any one time. However, if you go down to 8%, if you said, how have you had fatigue for one or more months, about 8% have that symptom. However, if you say six or more months of fatigue, then you get about 4% or one out of 20 people. So about one out of 20 people, 4%, 4 to 5% seem to have what we think of as chronic fatigue. So that's what you need to think about. It's actually a very large group of people. Um, four, four to five percent of the population. Next slide. Now let's look at some of the case definitions. Take that four percent of individuals with fatigue. If you use basically the FACUTA criteria, you'll get at the little circle at the bottom, a very small 0.4 percent, almost 10 percent. 10 percent of that four percent will meet the FACUTA CFS criteria. If you use what's called the Reeves criteria, which was developed about 10 years ago, you'll get a much larger group. You'll get more than half of them will meet the Reeves criteria. We haven't actually talked much about the Reeves criteria because it hasn't been used that frequently in the US, um, but the CDC continues to use that. Next slide. Now this is where it becomes, I think, pretty interesting. If you think about these individuals of individuals referred, in other words, if you have a medical clinic 
and you refer people to that medical clinic, what you will find is that about 92% will meet the Fukuda criteria of 1994. About 88% will meet the IOM SCID criteria. About 76% will meet the Canadian 2003 criteria. About 61% will meet the MEICC criteria, and we have a, a slightly different empiric criteria of four items that gets about the same number, which is four items rather than eight, which we think is just a different way of doing it. And then if you use what's called the London criteria, which is what Ramsey in 1988 and people like Ellen Gutsmith and others worked on from Great Britain, and you'll get about 20%. And one of the primary reasons you get so many fewer people of a specialist care getting that diagnosis of London criteria or, or ME is that it, it requires a sudden onset. Okay, that's figure three. Go to the next slide. So what I'm going to suggest to you is a categorization system that might be slightly different. Um, again, think about that 4% with six or more months of fatigue. About 1% will basically meet SCID criteria. Um, I call it um, IOM, the Institute of Medicine. We, we could call it something else, the IOM criteria, or we could call it NDS, Neuroendocrine Immune Dysfunction Syndrome, which was something coined about 10 years ago by a name change work group. The ME, the pure ME, is really a group that is at 20%, 0.1% which is a very small group that has a sudden onset, we could call it Ramsey criteria. Next slide. Okay, does this slide say research and consensus needed in three areas? Okay, so in summary, there are multiple case definition. Most common are the Bakuda CFS, the Canadian MECFS, and the MEICC um, criteria. Those are three that are very popular today. Each has different criteria. Um, for moving the field forward, we need to operationalize the current criteria to reduce criterion variance. We need to compare and contrast the current criteria. We need to use more sophisticated analytic structures to determine critical dimensions of a case definition. And I might add that we just published a article this last week using factor analysis where we had um, a very large sample of over 500 um, and you know the reality is that you need very large data sets 500 a thousand those are small we need data sets that are very large to do the types of sophisticated analytic procedures that are required and we also need to think about research versus clinical case definitions and this all becomes very important in general the research case definition should be the first thing we should develop the clinical case definition is then broadened because you don't need to have as homogeneous group. For example, a research case definition could say, you know, if you're very overweight with a body mass index that's very high, we won't put them in for a research case definition. Or if you're very, if you have an age that's very older, we might not put them in. But for a clinical case definition, we can relax those rules. So I think that research case definition really does come first rather than clinical case definition. Next, next slide. I think the broader IOM criteria represent a larger clinical group captured by the key IOM symptoms. It's a very large group. Because the term SCID has not been endorsed um, for these criteria, it's possible to use a different name, maybe calling it the IOM criteria, or maybe the neuroendocrine immune dysfunction syndrome. Um, I put in neuroendocrine dysfunction syndrome. Um, it was actually recommended by the name change work group 10 years ago in the U.S., neuroendocrine immune dysfunction syndrome, NDS. That could be a term that just refers to a large clinical criteria. Next slide. A research criteria could be much more narrow, and that could be based on myalgic encephalomyelitis, based on Ramsey's criteria. It could be empirically based, too. I mean, there's lots of different ways. It could be the MEICC criteria. It could be the Canadian CCC criteria. Clearly, we want a research criteria that's different than the larger clinical 
IOM criteria in order to develop our research with a more homogeneous group of individuals. And I think that's the challenge for our field today is to decide which case definition to use, and particularly which research one for the, the scientists in the audience. And it could very well be that we might end up using several. Um, it might be, but whatever you use, it's important to not only state which case definition you're using, but also to operationalize it. That's very important. One needs to have structured clinical interviews so that one can determine whether a symptom is met or not and how the questions are asked in a similar way. If you don't have the two things going together, the criteria and the way to assess it, you have all types of problems with reliability, which has plagued the field up till now. Okay, so the slide you have in front of you should say research criteria. Um, we're going to go on to the next one. Yes. So, in summary, the broader IM criteria could be used for clinical purposes. A more restrictive ME criteria could be used for research purposes. Some scientists might prefer to consider the clinical versus research grouping a matter of severity rather than categorical differences. But such a classification system has the potential to clarify discrepant findings from epidemiologic, etiologic, and treatment studies. Next slide. It's possible that those that do not meet the ME, Ramsey, for example, criteria or the broader IOM criteria could be classified as just having chronic fatigue, which is the most general category and represents those with six or more months of fatigue. Next slide. Now I'd like to move on to talking about something that this audience is very interested in, homebound. Whether you're using a clinical or a research criteria, certainly the homebound group is very important. But evidence of such this group is, is more impaired, we think it is, but we have limited data that's been collected and published in this area, which is unfortunate. And there could be a number of reasons. Maybe it's harder for these individuals to get into the laboratory to be studied, but for whatever reason, we have limited data on the most impaired who are homebound. Next slide. Our current study done by Tricia Pendergast and others at DePaul University, we had over 500 participants derived from samples in the US, UK, and Norwegian samples. And those are the samples and a little bit information about each of them. And we had different case ascertainment methods and again, a very large sample. And what we wanted to find out was what are the characteristics of homebound individuals across these different sites? Three different countries, four different sites. Next, next questionnaire, it says questionnaire design at the top. We have the DePaul Symptom Questionnaire, which was designed specifically for research with regarding um, ME-CFS, CFS, and ME, all the different clinical de case definitions, clinical Canadian criteria, ME, the FACUDA, so it measures all these. If you give this particular questionnaire, there's an algorithm which will tell you whether you met the fr frequency and severity to meet these different criteria. Um, we also use the Medical Outcomes Study Survey to measure the impact of health and physical and mental functioning to find out the questions. We also have questions re regarding demographics. By the way, this DePaul symptom questionnaire is on REDCap and it's available if anybody might want to use it. It's been translated into multiple languages um, and uh, it's being used around the world at this point. Next. Okay, this slide basically says results. The housebound patients experienced more severe illness. Very interesting. What we found is that the housebound patients had amplified symptomatology compared to individuals who are not housebound in this group of 500 on all these different areas of fatigue, post-exertional malaise, sleep dysfunction, bodily pain, neurocognitive, autonomic, neuroendocrine, immune function. So in all these areas, there was more significant impairment. And this article is now being written up and will be submitted for publication in the next few weeks. Next slide. Housebound patients with ME experience reduced functionality in general health functioning, physical activity, social functionings, vitality, and bodily pain. So we see major differences in functionality with, again, a very large sample. I might add that um, about 25% um, of our sample was housebound. Next slide. In terms of psychiatric differences, which says at the top of the slide, there were no significant differences in psychiatric conditions between those individuals who are housebound and those who are not housebound. 
There were no significant differences between the two groups with regards to mental health functioning or limitations in usual roles due to emotional problems. These results indicate that mental health or problems with daily activities as a result of emotional problems are not different between the housebound and the not housebound group. Because the last slide there basically, and I'm just going to announce that one of the things that the IOM basically said is that we need to have studies that not just look at people with ME and CFS, but we need to look at individuals who have other things like MS, lupus, cancer, and other illnesses and compare and contrast them so that we can find unique issues that differentiate these different illness types that have some overlap of symptoms but might have different ones. So I just wanted to mention we have a study that's now going on that we would like to recruit individuals. If you know people who have MS or lupus or cancer who might be interested in participating in the study, we will put up a slide um, so that you'll be able to see at some point. Um, if not now, it'll be on the kind of video so that you can have the link that can take you directly to our survey. Um, at this point, I do want to thank you all for allowing me to take the last half hour or so and make the presentation. Um, how did that last slide come? Did it, did it come? Oh, that's okay. Okay, you'll, you'll bring it up. But be, as you try to bring it up, why don't I kind of just open things up for questions? I know that there you wanted to have a little bit of time for people from the audience to ask me any questions. And I know we have just about maybe five minutes or so. So I, I'm very happy to entertain any questions. And again, I thank you all for your hospitality and invitation to come to your country. I wish I could be there in person, but I'm delighted that I'm able to come in through the Skype broadcast. Thank you. Yes, I ha thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Jason. Um, I'm not sure if you can hear me right now, but uh, if we have a question or two in the audience, so uh, please raise your hand now. Okay, just to let you know, um, you're going to probably have to have the other gentleman tell me the questions because um, I, 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 okay, as long as they're just said to me. Thank you. Do we have a question? No? Okay. Well, perhaps there in the middle, lady. We have a microphone coming up. So I guess you will have to repeat the question for. Yeah. Um, there are many other diseases that causes chronic fatigue and similar symptoms to, well, ME. Uh, and I wonder, can you be really sure that uh, those people, uh, they have not been diagnosed with MECFS because they have other chronic illnesses? Uh, and that is probably because they have very clear symptoms and uh, biomarkers of the other illnesses. But what I wonder is um, if these other illnesses can cause uh, MECFS, so they have both uh, conditions. If um, uh, we are sitting here, many of us have had a virus infection or something, and then something has gone wrong in our bodies, and I wonder if those who have chronic, other chronic diseases, ongoing chronic diseases, can have MECFS too. You'll need to repeat it for me. Thank you. Yes, what I'm what I'm trying to say is that the other chronic illnesses uh, that. Um, because it's a well-known fact that many illnesses cause chronic fatigue and similar symptoms of MECFS. Yeah, people, those who are specialists in the other diseases, they have not been interested in to uh, consider if these patients have MECFS too. Yeah, 
that there's a similar mechanism. So, so I, I think I, I get the gist of the question. And, and again, it's it's a it's an absolutely critical question, particularly with the new IOM SCID criteria. In a sense, basically, in the past, what I've suggested is about from people who come into a population-based study with, um, we think of, you know, chronic fatigue of six or more months, only about 20% would have been diagnosed with FACUDA criteria. And that's because 50% of people in that 4 to 5% with chronic fatigue would have clear medical or psychiatric exclusions. If you bring those people with medical and psychiatric exclusions and make them comorbid, ultimately what you will have is a larger number of people who meet the IOM SCID criteria. We estimate that at least 2.8 times as many people. So if you want to have a very large criteria that's clinical that brings in lots of people that have lots of different reasons for their illness, that's okay, but you absolutely have to think about the implications of that. And what that means is that you have people who have kind of probably many, many different types of illnesses in that category. So it's incumbent upon us as researchers to develop more research criteria and research case definitions that allow us to have more homogeneous groups. Now, I have just written a paper where I have actually compared the IOM SCID criteria with the Canadian criteria. And it's clear that the Canadian criteria does identify a more impaired group. So that's useful information. That article is being reviewed by a journal now. But I've also written a paper that has tried to break down the IOM into two groups. One group that had the, met the criteria and one group that had medical or psychiatric reasons. That's another possibility for research purposes for us to do something like that. But ultimately, the challenge for us as researchers is to have people who are as comparable as possible. The more heterogeneity we have in a sample, particularly with the IOM, the more difficult it will be for us to understand the characteristics of those individuals. However, for clinical purposes, if you want a wide group, um, the IOM is basically able to do that. And if you want to have something that's easy to use, the criteria are easy to implement. So there's those advantages of the IOM. My concern is that people will use the IOM for research purposes. And, and to the extent that they call it a research criteria, then we have all types of confusion. Remember, the Canadian clinical criteria are now used as a research criteria. The FACUDA research criteria were used as a clinical criteria. So why will not the IOM criteria have the same types of problems that the other ones have had over the last 20 years? Um, I'm just about out of time now. I just want to thank you all. Um, I, I, I don't want to sort of impinge on your, your schedule. I know you have other speakers planned, but, but um, if, if it's okay, I will um, just thank you at this point, and, and I hope you have the rest of the great conference. Thank you.